guess my question is, uh, so there seems to be a kind of sort of unspecified um, tension in your paper between abolitionism and abolition democracy, mm. um, right? So abolitionism, right. I take you to mean the sort of straightforwardly mm -hmm. the abolition of, of the prison industrial complex. Um, but abolition democracy is a much more sort of capacious term in that it proceeds from the premise um, that the condition of possibility for democratic self-governance in the United States was lynching, dispossession of native people, right, colonialism, imperialism, that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if you could sort of specify analytically the sort of relationship between the two. How exactly are they, are they sort of uh, working Went together? together. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I can try. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, I see, you know, abolition democracy not as a utopian endeavor. I mean, I was talking about blueprints, right? There's a practicality to it. But one of my problems remains is I don't see. I don't see a sufficient critique of what we're facing. Does that make sense? Like, if abolition democracy undoes the genocidal logic, you know, use Dylan Rodriguez or other people's language, um, of this present formation, then obviously that's a good that I support and I pursue. I still maintain that we would not get anywhere near abolition democracy unless we go through the state. Well, I don't know how you do it, but I mean, it's, I'm just, I don't wanna say old school, I don't wanna dismiss my thought and try to be cute up here or anything like that, you know, too old to be cute about anything. But as I said before, having grown up in a military family, I think from an, an early age, I understand how the utility of violence. It's utilitarian. Why else have it unless it worked, right? And it's, um, it's something that you would have, to, it's something that will not wither away. It's not going to dissipate because we have good ideas or good intentions or want to live in peace or... If you, I track the trajectory we're on now, and I'm finding that liberals are like, oh, is this the end of democracy? And they're having, you know, PBS specials and NPR, whatever. You know, it's just sort of like they just woke up about their precarity, right? Their vulnerability, <laughs> right? But if it was a, you know, you already know what I'm saying. Like, we've, we've already been through genocide. And then we've gone through genocide with genocide being popularized again. And that was supposed to be a cautionary tale, like genocide is bad, don't do it anymore. That cautionary tale didn't hold. The elites did not agree with that narrative. And now you have the largest, the US probably has the largest armed underground white supremacist movement in the world. And in the old days, like when I was younger and we were organizing, the whole thing about the biblical aspect of that in the rapture was that Jesus wouldn't come back until the time was ready. The new interpretation of it is Jesus asked for an ethnic cleansing before Jesus will come back. They've like upped the scale in some really interesting ways. And I don't see the progressives. I see the expansion of heart and compassion. I don't see a counter to organized terror, which the state will look the other way as it unfolds. Like we're in the Foucault moment and Terrence said on the archives burned in Highlander and I hadn't heard it and I was like, you know, in the panel and then so when I, came up afterwards, I was like, there wasn't even a murmur. Like in another era, if you were told that terrorists burned down your archives of liberation, we would be like, oh, lunch break, we're gonna meet in this room and we're gonna plan this out and we're moving on in some way. 
a statement, a protest, a moment of silent meditation, prayer. There was nothing. It was just like, oh, yeah, that, whatever. And it's next panel. So I'm not, I love the idea of what the future could be. I will not see that future. I will not live long enough to watch it materialize. I doubt my daughter will either. And so for me, I'm like, I just want to be utilitarian. Like, what is efficient? And if the most efficient is to call out violence and demand a critique of it, rather than this like, promissory note, I keep coming back to promissory note, which I think is different from King. When King did that last talk, I may not get there with you, but I will see you on the other side. That was from the point of like, I'm about to walk into martyrdom. And that was a transcendent moment that is very different from the pragmatic politics of book publication and building narratives about reform and progress when you're dealing with fascists. Does that make sense at all or not? I, I did the political prisoner book because not only did they say it, this was a waste of our reading time and then I felt bad and felt I had to anthologize, I did the anthologies, which is like 10 years is a long time to anthologize folks, right? You never get real credit because it's like, oh, she can't really write a book. She just like edits, right? I did the anthologies because they had been to war. And I think people who go to war really have clarity of sight. I don't trust anybody else. Not for that level of clarity of sight. You can write whatever you want unless you've been to war. I don't trust you because you don't know the nature of defense. That's right. Did you have a question? Uh, I have a question. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, just a quick question. Uh, earlier, I think the second question in the panel, uh, they're trying to, we were just, or the question was how to really connect uh, struggles in the prison to more radical organizing on campus. And I think I want to take that question and just kind of put it out further and really ground or ask how, like, or like how struggles in the prison can be used as a basis to rebuilding or to yeah, really rebuilding that revolutionary vanguard party that the BPP once stood for. And kind of in asking that question, I allude to um, Boots Riley and uh, yeah. yeah, like sorry to bother you and how like, and really just trying to figure out how to really draw a thorough line from like the prison space to the open space and really bringing out and drawing out that protracted struggle. So how do we, how can, how can not as, not, how can we as people acting as like neoliberal subjects and like this neoliberal capitalist landscape really be involved in prison organizing, not just limiting that kind of organizing to students who have like this kind of like thing, this idea of like having free time and being like uh, more fluid and being able to move around and being involved in that type of work. So, um, so I'm going to go talk a little bit about the past and then come back to the moment that you're talking about. Um, for me, it was corresponding with the incarcerated and listening to what they said. So when I was first doing the anthology here, it wasn't just with the Panthers, it was everybody. A correspondent with Leonard Peltier. I mean, these all, in prison intellectuals, it's just multi-ethnic, multi-racial, even though I'm talking primarily about black revolutionaries. But it was the Berrigans, who were former priests, the pacifists, who said for the conference at Brown, link it with shock and awe, because Bush was about to invade Iraq. 
under the pretense of you know, weapons of mass destruction and spark a genocide in Iraq, basic near genocide and destabilize the Middle East, right? And so the very fact that people inside think intellectually and can come up with their own ideas, like you know, ask them what they think is possible and permissible or useful, that sort of created a whole other template to the conference here at Brown. And it also had another radical or revolutionary edge to it because I think when it started to be a critique of the war, that's when we you know, saw pushback, like from governance, right? Like, what are you doing? Like, as long as it's a niche issue, like, oh, this is your little pool, you just swim in that pool and you do your good deeds there. But once you start doing the connectors, like we're not just talking about domestic policy, we're talking about foreign policy. We're not just talking about war inside a prison. We're talking about, you know, military industrial complex is a phrase that led to the prison industrial complex, right? That we're making these links. Then it's, for me, then you're in the midst. And that, you know, it's the, when I was saying like, I trust people who go to war, people who link, domestic policy with foreign policy, and it, does, it doesn't mean you're militarist, but who have and desire the analytical skills to do so are now in confrontation with the state. Because though, that was what the Panthers did. It was an international imagination that they sparked. And that's why Kathleen was essential. Like I was starting with Angela and I was like, oh, I'm gonna keep coming back to Kathleen, why? Because Kathleen was moving all over the world. Angela was in Europe to study. Then she went back to Europe when she was exonerated, right, and met with Foucault and, and gave talks and wrote and lectured, right, and organized in some ways. Kathleen was moving as an international emissary, like in Vietnam, in China, and all places that were engaged in revolutionary struggle, learning about that. And of course, the captives can't formally do that, but their minds do that all the time. George was influenced by Ho Chi Minh. The whole notion of George as a dragon philosopher, that comes from Ho Chi Minh. When the prison doors are open, the dragon will be released, right? Oh, and, right. and the thing about the dragon, right, you, wanna, you don't wanna live next door to them, you don't wanna have them in your co-op, you know? It's just like, nobody wants to be around a dragon. But if they have a function, you have to understand the function or you simply have to discredit their very being. It is, it's, this is the thing, dragons are made because they're tortured in dungeons. Then like, point to me who the torturers are. Then I'm in confrontation with state. Mm. Tell me who funded the death squads in El Salvador. You know the answer. I'm in confrontation with, you know like this whole thing about they're coming over the border. Part of the reason they're coming over the border is I grew up on um, Fort Benning, Georgia. You know, School of Americas was there. I don't know what my dad was doing, but he was an officer. They trained deaf squads for El Salvador and Guatemala. And then decades later, you have people like, the violence is off the hook, we can't. Yeah, because you had genocides that the US paid for, right? And I don't, I think we work in our areas, but the prison was never it. The prison was never the revolutionary site. George was in the prison, but George thought as a free man engaged in international revolutionary struggle. It wasn't, it was, that's the thing about the abolition. It was never about the prison. It was about empire in the world. But you can't, say empire in the world. You can't be anti-capitalism now in a capitalist system. You can't be anti-imperialism. Nobody even uses that language anymore. I don't even know what language people use anymore. But the language of the revolutionary, the language of the revolutionary was freedom. And the impediment to freedom was, you know, you can say racial capital, like Cedric, whatever. But the impediment to freedom was the military, was the CIA, was the DEA, was the FBI, was the Pentagon. And taking on those structures would shorten your time in the free world. But people still took on those structures. And I say at least as academics, we have the intellectual space to analyze those structures. 
so that our writing itself becomes a confrontation. We're not going to engage in physical acts against the state. The only question is, will we critique it? Or will we leap over it to sort of this, the goal is on the other side of the state? State's not going to let you pass. They've already made that clear. Whatever we create, they own. Whatever we create will become a commodity. It will not be freedom. So you would have to eliminate the state out of the equation. And nobody knows how to do that, in part because nobody's even thinking about that in public space, because it's not permissible thought. Revolution is illegal. I think, just a quick um, add-on, you mentioned that it's good that we listen to people who are in the mix of it, like actually in prison, struggling actively against the state. And to rebutters that you bring up Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. And I think, obviously, we're living here like in America as it exists right now. There's not, an, there's not a cadre marching through the countryside, mm -hmm. getting ready to go through prisons and open up the gates and let people out. But... Um, I just kind of wonder, is there more that people, lay people, people out in the streets can do to more align themselves with the people inside taking active measures against the state, like taking on a specific political ideology alignment? You bring up Ho Chi Minh, and that kind of uh, alludes to Mao and alludes to like Marxist-Leninism. So I just kind of wanted to see, I suppose, your take on that. I think there's a couple things, right? I think one, the people who want to get out, we need to be more effective in, in mounting parole. So Jalil Muntakim has been in for 48 years in New York. He's in the Black Panther Party in the BLA. He's already you know, expressed his regrets for whatever acts or actions were taken in the past. I mentioned earlier the NYPD's position, even if the parole board says you should get out, if you ever fought with the police, if you ever shot at the police, if you ever shot a policeman, you die in prison. So the police believes that they override the courts, that blue lives are more important than anybody else's lives, right? So I think a direct confrontation, and it could, doesn't have to be big C, it could be little C, but a pushback against police unions and the influence they have in parole boards to mount more effective campaigns on governments, you know, like governors, for people to be released, to have community control over the police. And actually, you know, there's just a, a simple logic in this. The moment you start doing any of this, they will start pushing back and you will end up in a confrontation. So it's like, do anything effective, and you will be meeting state structure. Do something that's not effective, and they'll give you a very long leash. So there are different ways to plan and mobilize. But for me, the guardians of the state are the police, the federal police, the state and the local. And as I said earlier, it reminds me of when Freddie Gray's uh, spine was severed in police custody and then Obama had just put in Loretta Lynch to replace Eric Holder, and the first thing out of both their mouths, Obama and Lynch were thugs, and then they walked it back, and then Obama showed contrition and said, I wish these families need more help, like better techniques or tactics in raising their kids, nothing about the police, like, needed to be completely rethought. But then he said something that for me was just telling and then I was like, okay, now I can move on. He said, I cannot federalize the police, which is not a standard verb in, in American language. And what he was saying, he can't control the police. And if the President of the United States cannot control the police to keep them from doing racist killings and rapes, and he just admits it, like to the public, then okay, then I don't, I mean, I will vote and I will organize, you know, on the next campaign, but my primary in energy is not directed towards anything that's ineffectual. Trump will not, he will enable the police to engage in more violence with impunity, but the good president just said he was ineffectual. So then, like, there has to be a third way. 
And so the architects of abolitionism would be the people who found the third way, not the people who continue to petition to the state for redress. Because the state has made it very clear, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, they have no intention of undoing this. They can live with a predatory structure because it's profitable. So the new architects will have to design another one and will not agree to the terms of the contract. And that, you know, we could talk about an imaginary fugitive. You can't really talk to incarcerated people about this stuff because then they get put in the hole and whatnot. But there's the practical stuff you do day to day. And you don't even have to ask me about it because you already know what you do because it's local. But what is going to be national and international is what will undo the current structure. And that means an architect with a new blueprint. And I've yet to see anyone on the national stage, particularly who functions as a celebrity, to wield that kind of intellectual capacity. I find it from the political prisoners who are pulling 48 to 50 years. I found it in Eric, Erica Gardner before she died, just you know, from grief and poor health and poverty. I find it in these spaces where it's not supposed to exist. I don't find that intellectual capacity among the elites. So I, you know, I mean, this is where we work, we operate, but if we think this is where the political imagination is for freedom, I would think that that would be an odd thought. So I'm not blowing your question off, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. <laughs> 